So, so for you who are new here, like uh, uh, we are serverless Toronto user group, uh, and uh, this time we have a unique topic. Uh, normally, normally uh, we have technical talks, and you learn something. This one is cultural, and soon I'll tell you why. So, if you're expecting to learn to code tonight, that's not going to happen. Uh, but uh, like the topic is is geared towards startup owners or people who fail with startups or want to run some startup companies and. And the first, like, because we rarely talk to, to people like yourself, thank you for coming. Uh, we have to explain why it's worth your time to be here, not just pizza. And uh, then, like, uh, it's a different problem you have to solve than most of us who are geeky. Uh, and then to help you see how to leverage ca cloud, because we've seen many wrong ways to do it. Uh, and then we're gonna, we believe, like, serverless is the best way to, to, to go into cloud natively. And the last one is going to be brainstorming, like we're going to allocate the rest of the time for you. Talks are normally around one hour, but this is, I expect, to be around half an hour, so we have more time to mingle and exchange ideas. And uh, so the first chapter is like, uh, why, why do you want to be here and why do we have this topic? Uh, like being addicted by serverless, uh, I was saddened and surprised to see that uh, not so many companies are using it. And you would fit, we would think that startups are the perfect fit for serverless, yet it's not happening. And, and, and I had no explanation for that. And, and uh, I contacted my friends who are doing coaching uh, serverless workshops. Like, people barely show up. You're happy if you have eight people in the room, six to ten. So, so, and it's all geared towards startups. So something was happening, and I didn't understand what. So. I started uh, talking to the startup owners, but not those struggling, those who, who are over the hump. Because as a business owner, like you have so much to do to, to, to run and build a business. And, and I count successful ones, those that don't have to worry about paying their bills, uh, that the business comes to them. So on the other side, apparently, I was surprised, even the guys who are purely technical startups, Nobody worries about technology, not serverless, but any technology. So they worry about finding business, they worry about finding uh, uh, money, they worry about finding people, but not, uh, not using the, the, what technology they use. So that's why uh, startups uh, don't even kind of pay attention to serverless. And despite us believing that it's like almost like flossing your teeth, it's important, but people forget to do it. And, and so, so that was the reason we set up this talk. So why this user group? Uh, so as the time evolves, when serverless started in 2014, 15, and 16, when other vendors adopted it, it was more about f functions as a service, like just this glue that you pour in the code. But over the years, the word less is becoming more important than the word server. So it's about less IT mess, about less servers to manage, less code to write because you have small, lower uh, cyclomatic complexity. And then, and then because it like, resembles to the kid playing with Lego pieces, it's kind of more playful and more fun and you can deliver business value faster. That's what we believe. Also the community about sharing, so everybody's welcome to, to share their experiences, what, what they learned. And, and uh, uh, we uh, run, like, because everybody has to pay the bills, and, and this is capitalism after all. Uh, but we try to put corporate interest second and, and the community interest first. And we're also part of the bigger, bigger ecosystem uh, community. Like, there's 30 meetups around the world, I believe. So it's our extended family. And uh, uh, why me? Like, uh, I've been in IT like, a really long time. Uh, so, so, what, 90, 87, 88. And uh, I've seen it all from, from the IT being like uh, two guys in the corner, uh, then, then until like IT took over the offices. Like now in the companies, you have three floors of IT and, and half the floor of, of, of the business. And, and then there is politics, there is dogma, and now we are scrambling to go through the uh, digital transformation. So uh, for years since coming to Canada, I was a contractor and then kind of over the winter, I wanted to do something meaningful after three decades of career just running after money and, and, and any job people wanted me to do. So there was a room to simplify IT by spreading this serverless movement. It's almost like a religion, like it's almost spiritual <laughs> to me. And, uh, and also like uh, uh, out of those 30 years, so, so depend how you count it, but over 10 years I spent it four to five startups, which I all managed to fail. So at least I'm a good anti-pattern. If you're doing something, I can tell you what not to do. 
So, uh, so now, now what I learned uh, while visiting TechTO, Health TechTO, other startup related meetups and, and interviewing uh, the, the business owners. So yeah, that's, that's I wanted to uh, tell you how I interviewed business owner. I came up with a, a questionnaire, two questions for them to answer. One was top three things what to do when you're running a business and another one top three mistakes to avoid. And uh, only one of like a dozen people had one mentioned technology. And he got burned really hard, uh, growing, scaling his business. But nobody, nobody like, was thinking about that at the time. And so, so basically, uh, big companies that I've seen, they're struggling going through digital transformation like now. And the small guys, they're just thinking which corporate each to scratch. Like, where do you find the money? What, what business to go through? So. Uh, I, I, uh, there are a few opportunities for you where, where you can kind of look how to grow a business. So the first one, the, the first type of business is, uh, is to do something better than the guys before you. So it's incremental type of opportunity. Business exists, need exists, you just do it better and faster. So one example last time uh, was a lady on Tech of meetings. She's running online insurance. So the business is old, everybody needs it but she does it online cheaper, not in Ontario, however, she couldn't register it here. So that's one type of the business. Another type of the business is that you notice the gap in a product offering, typically cloud, uh, or, or like there was, a, when Docker came, like everybody wanted to do Docker for enterprise, and uh, there was a gold rush, who's gonna do that eventually? Docker company itself created the Docker for enterprise. But uh, that space, uh, uh, has you have to act really quickly. So for instance, if cloud vendors know that they're missing some features, it's gonna close sooner or later, and that applies to my friends from Seed uh, with the tooling, uh, whatever there is gap. So the best way to use uh, gap fillers is to use it as trampoline to get known, to get the teams, and then bounce out of the market to something you really wanna do. Uh, the hardest category to be in as a startup is a, a category creator. That's, I'm, I'm like, they are mostly doomed to fail because there is not too many Netflixes, Dockers, and, and Ubers in the world. You will know that you are in the category creator if nobody understands what you're talking about, if nobody understands who will buy what you're building, and then, and then when you become kind of, when you start getting breakthrough, people start to copy you but that does not happen often. So I would personally stay away from that space. Like it's, it's just, you know, it's not just you, it's uh, your life, wives and uh, kids and families that go by and, and you keep failing with those businesses. And then, and then there is opportunity to leverage. Like you can use leverage in any of the previous segments, but the cloud itself enables, uh, is a huge enabler of the leverage from these huge uh, GPU enabled processors to machine learning algorithms. Like there is so much you can do faster, better, or, or new that wasn't done before using the leverage. But then it's a broad term. So, so how, how do you build the leverage? So that's, uh, that's uh, what I wanted to cover. I don't know who of you heard about Simon uh, Wardley. Uh, so not too many people. So that's a UK researcher. So he was CEO of the companies and he discovered that all these maps, system diagrams, SWOT diagrams that we use, they don't help you much with success in the business because none of them has a time component. Uh, he was comparing to the, he was studying art of war and military like uh, uh, doctrine. There is always time uh, component involved and, and he started positioning, so basically uh, what he, he's starting to advocate, that everything that starts has expiration date, has kind of time at the prime where it just discovered, and then, and then uh, 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 it's hard to point here, so, so it's first custom built, for instance, cars. First it was only Henry Ford driving one, then his buddies. Then, you know, more people have the car, then it becomes commodity. Even if you can own it, you can uh, rent one. So, opportunities are born. After that, you see Uber started here. When something new happens, when it becomes commodity, people use it as a new base to bring more value up the value chain. And then when things stabilize with the new things, for instance, electricity, when it's stabilized, you start building like a 20th century reality here. And, 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 then, and then, for instance, like electricity enabled internet, internet enabled cloud, so that's a new level. So as you move up, so this is only one layer, but you can 
you can pretty much apply it to, to anything. So examples that I like to use is cloud-enabled machine learning. Like machine learning algorithms existed before, but you needed extremely powerful CPUs. You needed extremely huge amount of disk space. So it enabled machine learning to, to glow. And then machine learning and deep learning enabled voice technologies. Like with my accent, with my hoarseness and the speed of talk, and I worked in IVRs. There was no speech recognition engine for 20 years that could detect what I'm saying. Suddenly, Alexa becomes my friend. Why? Because uh, they benefit from the cloud, from the machine learning, from hundreds of thousands of people with the thick and weird accents like mine, and they can figure out what we say. So it's a whole new industry. Now, if you, if you do, there is hashtag voice first. It's a whole new thing that did not exist five years ago. So, so it's moving up the ladder, but as it starts coming, that's your startup space. You can fail, you can succeed, you don't know, it's unknown. But whoever becomes Uber or Docker has opportunity to commoditize that and to start a new reality up at the top. So serverless, like uh, two years ago, like people didn't understand it, there was doubt. Now, now it's moving here, like now people are this, accepting it. So you have a vendor jumping with tooling, uh, like a, uh, 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 it's a gold rush what you do in serverless. So hopefully like some of you are going to get ideas and a uh, few years from now you're going to be talking how you did it using these technologies. So that's, that's uh, uh, so all those diagrams that we had given the time component. And so now I, I kind of like you know you want to do cloud, like uh, it's, it's no brainer, but, but how to do it? There are so many ways to go to the cloud. And most likely, if you start a owner, you have a problem finding people to trust you to work for you. You're going to get first guy from the street who wants to do code for you. And he doesn't know any better than to spin the instance uh, of the server in the cloud. So you immediately, out of the box, sentence to have the legacy in the cloud. So th this was from October. This guy works for iRobot. Uh, a Roomba, I think, these uh, vacuum cleaners. So he said that EC2 is new on-prem. So if you just use that, uh, like it's, it's, you're losing it straight out of the gate, despite of the cloud. But it's such a broad term that everybody claims that they will give you a solution that's following cloud native principles. And, and so in, in reality, so this is kind of goals that everybody talks about, but not all of them deliver up to the end. So self-service, like you remember that, I don't need to sell you cloud, like everybody uh, uh, can do that. So EC2 is Amazon's way of doing infrastructure as a service. One thing I forgot to tell you at the beginning, uh, all the examples I'm using in this talk, they're Amazon specific because that's the cloud I know, but there is nothing in this talk uh, that is uh, specific, like that does not apply to other clouds. So we're completely cloud vendor agnostic. Anybody, anybody can, uh, it applies to all the clouds. Okay, guys, somebody needs to take my credit card. The pizza is here. Sorry for the delay. Uh, let's make a short break until I pay this pizza. So you had your pizza. Keep. So where were we? What was the last slide? Yeah, so it was about going incorrectly into the cloud. And, and, and these cloud native principles, they rename the same, like people always want it, but the way it's, it's executed is different and you can achieve more uh, than, than just out of the box. So first benefit, like you see, no waiting for the service. So EC2 does that. So that's Amazon's uh, infrastructure service offering. Uh, and then uh, self-service that also does it. Globally distributed, like they have data centers worldwide, so you don't need to build it, so that's no brainer. But then high availability when you come, if you just get uh, uh, instances yourself, you would have to take care uh, to, to put some thought into building high availability. And elasticity, uh, working in the data centers because you buy the max capacity, the strongest computer you can have. We were normally scaling it up, but not scaling it down. Now, because you're paying for the uh, computers, you have to think how to scale down as well. So that's something that serverless helps and moves you further. And then an immutable code is also always there, which it's mostly focus of DevOps engineers nowadays. Uh, because the things, so before in the past, when you buy expensive computer, you try to use it as long as you can to put as much stuff as you can on that computer. So, so every new code has to live, coexist with the other applications that you had on that hardware. 
and there was lots of patching. You could not just replace machines now because it's in the cloud. Machines come up so quickly. There is a concept of immutable code, meaning that rather than uh, patching the code you have, you would create new version. Then you're going to use blue, green, or canary deployment to shift the traffic to the new version. That means that you have to do some versioning as well. And, 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 and spin up new service. And also the mindset has changed because before you had a few expensive servers, there was this mindset that they are pets. Everybody had a name. Now it's a cattle. Like you just get rid of one, put a new one uh, in. So that's, that's the benefit of cloud. Like uh, everybody talks about that, but depending who works for you as a startup owner, uh, it's probably not going to likely get you very far. And, and that's why uh, we wanted to talk about serverless. So. Here's the weather forecast. Uh, like uh, two months ago, there was AWS Summit in Toronto. 3,000 people came in, and they were doing like polls on the tweets, what's trending. And, and this was the big one, uh, that uh, AWS Lambda, which is Amazon serverless offering, like uh, functions and service, will be the next summit. That can translate into serverless is the future of the AWS cloud. But uh, like, uh, uh, I need to do some more convincing why we believe uh, that serverless first as a startup is the right way to go. So, as a startup, you're hoping to become infinitely popular, and then serverless will give you that option. You will have not to worry about scalability. Another beautiful thing with serverless architecture is that it does not cost you anything to run if nobody's using it. So, as you're testing new solutions, if you have no customers, you don't pay for that. And, and then also there is less operations and there is less lines of code to write. So I really respect this non-functional benefit of serverless that wasn't talked that much about two, three years ago when it started. It's a speed of innovation. So to me, serverless is becoming new agile. Uh, because like in the agile terminology, you're going kind of sprinting faster. Two week sprints became one week sprints. But, but uh, in, in, in serverless, you just have this bigger leg of pieces that you put things together, and then you can iterate fast, and that really means experimenting with the solution. So because uh, uh, serverless using building blocks, these component, components like Legos may be rough around the edges when you put them together. They would resemble the object you were building, but may not be completely uh, ideal, but they're easy to modify, to extend, to change. So they get your idea tested in the real world faster, like that MVP, minimum value product, to see if customers stick, if anybody wants it. And, and then, if, if you, like it's, you're not sentenced to use serverless, you can always go back, use containers, you can use other technologies, like you can always do custom development uh, to change something that, that does not fit 100%. So, so that was kind of where serverless is today, and, and I would urge you to click on this link when I send the presentation. Uh, Adrian Cockcroft uh, now works with Amazon. He's the guy who created Netflix. And, and like what we're enjoying today, it's due to his open-minded way of looking uh, at things. And uh, here you will see uh, in the presentation that he did at event last year, he has 20 slides where he condensed the application architecture uh, completely from the monolith until, and it's combined, breaking monolith is combined with the speed of networks and uh, interfaces from big SOAP to smaller JSON until it became microservices. And, and then uh, and then all the way to, to function. So I will skip through the slides. This is the first slide. I will just show you the final slides and explain where this, the plot goes. So uh, as you're breaking up the monoliths into pieces, cloud vendors, because they see everybody, they identified some building blocks uh, that are commonly used. So, so you, have, you have this API gateway, you have S3 storage, you have uh, SNS, SQS. So these are the Lego pieces that they offer everybody to build on top. So your microservices with the building's logic in behind. But uh, uh, as, as what's history, like this was a few years back, this, micro, this microservice business logic was a glue between standard pieces. They broke down to even smaller pieces. So that's OK. That would be function as a service, as, as a lambda. But beautiful part about that, it's passive. It's inactive. Nothing runs. Nothing costs you. So the moment you have input, something triggered, it, it wakes up the system behind. It does the work and goes to sleep again. So it's like breathing. It's, it's so kind of. It's alive. So that's something unique that most of the guys you hire from the street to help you start I will not tell you. And, and I keep making references to, to uh, Legos. And, and let's proceed on that note about uh, serverless uh, adoption. 
So if you were to, with continuing with Lego analogy, uh, if you compare traditional development to manufacturing where you're making a toy spaceship, uh, you would kind of have to mold these pieces precisely. Uh, it would take you months to build a spaceship in that shape that looks perfectly. However, if you start playing with Legos, you can quickly start prototyping that something that kind of people recognize it's a spaceship. It's not, it has, it's rough around the edges, but you can quickly customize it. So for instance, I, I decided I'm going to change the tip. I don't like this one. And, and then you build it from the pieces. And then optimization, for instance, like let's see like this part of the ship, like it should really kind of be, be rounded and, and not this rough looking part. So you as a vendor or the Lego as a manufacturer that decides to build a custom piece. And, and, and you see how, how, how it's similar, like playing. So, so now, same thing, traditional development versus a rapid uh, development. So same like this model of the ship, full custom design versus bricks. Months of work versus hours of work to glue things, to put things together. Custom components, and that's a problem. Like if you develop something custom, how many users did you have? How, how is it tested? Everything's beta, alpha, you don't know if it works. Here, if you use standard cloud components, and I'm not advertising Amazon, like every vendor has standard components you can use. Uh, it's well tested, well documented, you can pick any book, any tutorial, come to us and start gluing pieces together. And then, and then uh, it, I've been seeing the clients, uh, like they're still kind of deciding uh, which do they use, Kubernetes or ECS or something on their own, or are they going to use uh, Chef or Puppet or Ansible, like there are so many meetings, that this is a long decision process. Uh, serverless and Lambda is very opinionated, so you just kind of do microservices their way, you get something out quickly. And then if it need be, you can go back to optimization. So now, at first, I was criticizing ECS, uh, sorry, EC2, uh, like IS as a service, infrastructure as a service. Now, now we're comparing containers, because I've seen that often in Toronto, so most people I spoke to, uh, they pay the bills not doing serverless, but doing containers, doing regular infrastructure. That doesn't have to be so, uh, because, so, so what happens, so these are the standard building blocks you have, and then if something does not work the way you want it, and probably there are some clearly used cases that are not good serverless, like life and death situation, because you have this delay of cold start, so you would optimize that, or serverless is good for these spiky loads for startups when you don't know if you're going to customers. If the load becomes predictable, steady, then you may be better off to have a container uh, like if, if, uh, as optimization. But it's not all or nothing, it's just one part of the system that you will modify and plug in into your uh, other serverless architecture. So. so that would be, uh, so, uh, so, so again, to, to uh, to emphasize, we are not advocating leaving things that, that existed before. Uh, like everything that you believed in before is still good. Uh, and and I, I really like containers. Serverless would not exist without containers. But it's like the engine in the car. Like I love to drive, to drive business around, to give them solution. I still don't know how to do anything but change, uh, to add some fluid, how that works. And that's the ignorance, uh, that's the beauty of serverless that it allows. You don't need to know what's under the hood. And, uh, and also, so, 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 so we do believe that. And one of the things that changed with the serverless definition when it started, it was just this lambda function. Now it's a function as a service and the backend and the service. So, so I was approached with somebody asking me about refactoring uh, big applications into serverless world. Very often you don't need completely, like to, you can leave it as is, just wrap it with an API. Uh, give me predictable SLA, service level agreement, so I know what I'm dealing with if I need to throttle uh, the, the access to you. And to me, you're becoming back end of the service because it's not my problem to manage and it's not my uptime, it's, it's your responsibility. So that works as well. So, it's, uh, so do not leave what you have, just think how that integrates with, with the new stuff. So now about serverless adoption, back to that. So there is not too many people that you can talk to that I could talk about adoption. The reason I have this talk is, is I met uh, online through conferences, Joe Emerson. He was the guy, so while I kind of failed four startups over 10 years, he succeeded in four startups in uh, three years. 
And those are all serverless startups. So the technology itself enabled him to do that. But it's not just the technology, it's a mindset. So mindset not made here. Mindset that, you know, use whatever you have just to get customer happy, to, to test the solution. So his biggest problem was, and he still has that problem, fourth company in, his problem finding developers uh, that, uh, that uh, most of us just want to do cool things. So you see the quote that, that he was, so what says, why would anybody work? Uh, like in the cloud, with all the cool stuff is done by the vendor, and 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 that that's hurting us as industry when we have the powerful tool that can move uh, the businesses forward. So, with my personal experience, so that was Joe. So, what I've seen in the companies that I worked with, so there are different kind of there is uh, guys that are behind and guys that are ahead, and and it's okay. Like if if some people are just stuck in the past, like your company's working, everything's good, you live your life, and you're capitalizing from the past success, so that it's okay not to move forward for no reason. Then there is the job security also because with this move and outsourcing, and people are afraid. So, if the companies became so big. Sometimes it does feel like a syndicate where people are doing job security, kind of making things more complicated and not adopting something that can eventually, that they're afraid, they think they can take their jobs away. But that's okay too. We've seen that all, all the time, like from, from hundreds of years, that was a problem. To me, a real problem was working with the people who did not want to use anything that exists, but wanted to build their own. And companies are plagued like, by, by uh, not invented here syndrome. So, so I, I think like we should start to learn to love your APIs as much as we love our APIs, and and then when we finish, when we see that there is real client, then we can rewrite it and optimize it, but not out of the gate before you know if your idea works. And another thing that happens like in in big organizations, like uh, I've seen it uh, a number of years. years. I'm, Agile is nice, like since extreme programming days, I was uh, one of the early adopters and, and I love ag uh, Agile, but with the arrival of Scrum, it became almost militant, like, like it's, a, it, it's just kind of focused too much on these charts, velocity, very often Scrum Master wouldn't even know where you're going, what you're building, and they don't care because you just go fast in a circle, taking business nowhere. So, so that, that's unfortunate and, and serverless can help. Uh, because it will allow you to experiment faster, to prototype faster, and deliver that value that businesses uh, need. So, so that was my kind of like situation with the, 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 the industry and, and like uh, some advice where to go next. Uh, so, if you're a startup owner, like first, like kind of avoid, avoid falling into the rabbit hole. So you will. We as geeks, I'm guilty myself, uh, can easily fall into that trap and, and you don't even know it, you're going in the wrong direction. And we'll take business with us. So, so the way to avoid uh, uh, not getting where you wanted to go because you were working with the wrong guys is to keep learning, keep sharing information and strive for simplicity. Too many of us enjoy working on complex things, something that we're going to be proud of, some frameworks, without uh, forgetting about the end user and, and business. So, so if, if you are not a business owner, but a developer, ops guys and engineers, I, I would ask you to sign up for this group. You're already here, but register uh, and come to our meetings. We, we are community driven. Uh, we meet monthly and we are totally cloud agnostic. And it's hard to believe that because all the talks we had were, were Amazon, but like I was born, like I, I didn't choose how I was born. I was born Christian Orthodox. My wife was born in, in Bosnian Muslim, but nothing stops you from loving one another. Not over there, we're here now. But, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but still like, so, so if you, if your organization chose another cloud, please come out, please join us, uh, share information that, 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 that you know with us. And, and also, like I'm noticing the trend more and more uh, meetups in Toronto are switching to workshop style because it's easier to learn in the, in the group setting. So uh, our friends uh, Jay and Frank uh, are starting a, a set of a workshop for serverless. So uh, just sign up there, tell your friends who want to learn with them. It's going to be a, a real interactive learning. Uh, and, and, and then if you're a business owner, first like I ask, I beg you to challenge your IT guys because 90% uh, of the time, it, it may not be uh, like 100% correct or true. And, and just challenge them to adopt mindset of serverless. They don't have to migrate to serverless, just to think out of the box, to start loving other people's APIs, to start refactoring their apps to 12-factor. 
Uh, and then, and then uh, so it's not only about serverless, there is other things that startups go through. So uh, the company I, I'm uh, in now, it was Trainimbus, but the new name is Onica. Uh, we are starting something called Landing Zone because when you go into the cloud, there are so many paths you can take and everybody goes different ways. So Amazon is, is pushing and, and we are helping them standardize the offering for enterprises now that you have because you have multiple accounts, you, you need the compliance, you need auditing, you need governance, you need security. There is so much other stuff that's needed. So at the moment, like we don't have offer for serverless startups and, and the data lake startups, but if you are interested, contact me. I will work with my managers uh, like because it's not just nine to five things. It's a hobby for me to, to make it applicable for you in a fraction of price. So normally, typical this offering is for companies like the number that don't be scared of the number. It's, I'm talking about big companies. So we charge for this around $60,000 just to kind of get you going quickly so you don't want you feel safe in the cloud. Like it's going to be way less fraction of it uh, if, if you do it for your data lake projects or, or, or for serverless offering, anything you have. So, but this is not about sales pitch. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, startups, and typically, a uh, typically years old belief was that you. So, so in like in everything, you have companies that are slow, and you have companies that are small. So you don't want to be in this space. Uh, you don't want to be in this space either. So normally, uh, they were teaching us to choose the competitor who is big but slow. You don't want to kind of compete with Microsoft that innovates quickly or Amazon. But what's happening because of, of, of the next thing, these companies are stuck in digital transformation. So it's perception that they're fast, but they're really not. Like I've been there, I've seen that. So, so the DevOps movement started in order to speed up or, or kind of to, to, to stop a divide between developers and operations. And instead of making it simpler, the places I've seen, uh, they have another wall. So now they have three parties uh, fighting instead of two. And, and, and it sometimes feels like cannibalistic, like the, the companies are moving nowhere, like it's just sad to watch. So don't be afraid to take big plays because I know they're here. And, and then the, the kind of, so that's what I'm saying, but uh, I recently attended one AI meetup when somebody pulled this quote from uh, Rupert Murdoch that the world is changing very fast, big will not beat small anymore, but it will be fast beating the slow. So that's how I would like to end this presentation, uh, uh, the reason we came to that, you know. Uh, uh, the, the, I was inspired again by uh, Joe Emerson because he's a kind of serial entrepreneur. He just creates those serverless startups, startups that are using serverless technology and his serverless mindset uh, and sells them and moves to his now on his fourth. And then the wisdom, uh, like I really am sucker for Adrian Cockroft. Uh, like um, I think uh, eight out of 35 slides I have uh, borrowed from his different talks uh, that he gave, and these are the links. So really, he's wizardry, wizard for me. And I was lucky to work for, for in his group when I was at Sun Microsystems. So strategy-wise, uh, and, and to have some like laughs go with us, uh, Simon Wardley, uh, he talks about the history of computing and strategy and how to compete in this space in such a funny way that you sometimes feel, uh, I, I, I call him Mel Brooks of IT, like he just, just so funny, like uh, try to watch any of the, uh, the first video I put, and these are the slides here. And then experience is my own, just like 30 years plus of experience that I've seen everything wanted to share with you. We hope to help you. So that, that's it. Thank you.